After we had invested so much love and passion and had put my heart into this land, into creating what you see, I realized that there was this deliberate attempt to take away our property rights. And I, I became scared, not just for myself and saving my farm, but for the impact this would have on, on all Virginians and really all Americans. I mean, if this could happen to me, it could happen to any farmer and it could happen to anybody. In 2006, Martha Bonetta bought a tattered 200-year-old farm in Paris, Virginia, on 64 beautiful acres an hour west of Washington, D.C. Liberty Farm should be the realization of Martha's childhood dream to become a working farmer in Virginia and bring homegrown organic produce to her community. But corruption and abuse of power in Fauquier County threatened to put Martha out of business. My name is Martha Bonetta, and I grew up in uh, Mount Vernon, Virginia. And my mom always said that we grew up on what was a part of George Washington's pig farm. From an early age, I had told my parents, you know, I really wanted to be in farming. And um, I would think my parents may have been secretly hoping that I would have abandoned that dream, but I never did. From the very beginning, we ran into almost immediate problems through the county and through an environmental group that made it almost impossible to really be successful. The property had been a neglected part of a massive 1,250-acre estate known as Ovoca Farms, which was owned by Phil Thomas, a fifth-generation landowner and real estate developer in Fauquier County. In 2000, Mr. Thomas sold most of that estate, including Liberty Farm, to a private land trust called the Piedmont Environmental Council. When Martha purchased the farm in 2006, the PEC attached a contract called a conservation easement to the deed, permanently preventing urban development on the land through a co-management arrangement with a state agency called the Virginia Outdoors Foundation. We've mostly done our work through conservation easements, which is working with private landowners to help put development restrictions on the land. If you think of property rights as a bundle of sticks, what an easement does is it takes certain sticks and it extinguishes that stick. So when you sell the property or you transfer it to another landowner, they now inherit a smaller bundle of sticks and it's a legally binding document. Martha's easement was written to prevent urban development and does limit some of what she's allowed to do with her property. But the terms were designed to preserve the agricultural, historical, and environmental value of the land. And that's exactly what Martha wanted to do with the farm. When I saw this farm, I wanted to save it. I wanted to save this barn. It was in tremendous disrepair. It had to be lifted up on hydraulic lifts. The silo didn't have a cap. There were trees growing and vines that had just taken over the barn. We couldn't even have animals here until we had properly put in new fencing and um, secured the farm. After two years of hard work, with the help of Martha's friends and family, the historic Liberty Farm was finally operational again. Martha planted vegetables and raised livestock. She even opened a small rescue operation to help save sick and injured animals in the area. Soon, she had local customers coming to her farm every day. And for a fleeting moment, Martha believed that she had turned her childhood dream into reality. Once she put the signs up and tried to draw people in to purchase things is where the roads diverged. She began to have the local government come down and slap and slap and beat down for no real reason. Even though it's a barn and we're allowed to repair the barn, we had completed all the proper paperwork, the county would just send people randomly to the barn to see what we were doing. We had actually put up handmade signs on the farm, and in fact, one of the elected officials referred to them as akin to gypsy signs because they were handmade. And the county said that we needed to replace them, and we ended up having to spend a lot of money to put professionally made signs on our farm to advertise. We discovered that our neighbor had sent a picture of an abused horse and had sent it to animal control the sheriff's department, and anybody that would hear her alleging that this horse was my horse on my property. You know, animal control did come to the farm. There was no issue. 
The Piedmont Environmental Council also began accusing Martha of violating the terms of her easement, and their inspections grew increasingly antagonistic. But strangely, the Virginia Outdoors Foundation, which co-manages Martha's easement, has never had a problem with her. Well, we can only speak to the portion of the easement that we co-hold and that we're responsible for stewarding. But um, yeah, we've, we've had no issues with her. If there have been issues, we've resolved them. Martha is in complete compliance with her conservation easement. So it is not the conservation easement in and of itself that is the problem. It is the PEC's enforcement of that conservation easement and their twisting of that conservation easement to harass Martha, which the PEC has done ever since. If you are in compliance with your conservation easement and are still being bullied, that is an abuse of power, and this is exactly what the PEC has done. Just so I'm, I want to make sure I understand, you want to look inside of my stalls for the... I just want to see the downstairs level. Okay, what are you looking for? I'm looking for any changes. That's, I just well, you're not to supposed to be it. looking for changes. It's very specific. Do you understand why you're here? It's not to look for changes. Change, changes that could accommodate a residential use. That's not exactly correct. What is it exactly that we're, we are looking for evidence of whether or not this is being used as a residence? Okay, okay. That's, what, that's what's in the easement. It, and you need to look in closets. Why don't you look in the refrigerator, too? I'm really not... I'm, look, I don't want to get into an argument about this. I'm asking if I can look in the closet. It's a yes or no question. It sounded like, to me, that Martha was being railroaded by something. We didn't know exactly what at the time. The source of Martha's harassment remained a mystery until early 2009, when her bank sent her a letter documenting a series of bizarre inquiries about her mortgage. Uh, one of our board of supervisors colluded with another party to have my mortgage either called in or purchased. We didn't realize that there was a coordinated, calculated attempt to get us off of our farm. We really didn't understand why we were being attacked from all these different government agencies and what was going on behind it. As Martha looked into the bank's documentation, public records, and emails obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request, she started seeing a pattern of cooperation between Fauquier County Supervisor Peter Schwartz, the former owners Phil and Patricia Thomas, and the Piedmont Environmental Council. Their goal? Rein in this dreadful woman. Martha is the most loving and innocent and honest working person, one of the most that I've ever met. The Virginia legislature uh, gave counties broad discretion in land use laws, and it started out as a good thing, as you, you want local control over local issues. But you have people in county government who have all this power and no checks on their power. Of course they're going to abuse their Ultimately, this is about power, who has it and who does not. Originally, and this is simply conjecture on my part, they thought simply by bullying her a little bit, they could get her to knuckle under and get that property, which she had restored, into someone else's hands. Martha would simply would have been uh, regulated out of existence and had no alternative in the end but to sell the property that she dearly loved and that she wanted to keep. Since the PEC and Fauquier County refused to be interviewed, we can only speculate on their motives. But they have developed a reputation for opposing any kind of development in the area. It started in 1993 when they prevented Disney from building a theme park. But since then, the county has gone after every type of commercial development, from farm stores to local inns, restaurants, and wineries. We are in Fauquier County and it's a terrible county to do business. We're trying to get a special event permit here just to, so we can do up to 30 people and it's ridiculous. It's, and it, it makes it difficult to run a successful business in this county. And that's what um, my owners and other people in the county are trying to change. After the failed attack on her mortgage, Martha began to experience increasingly frequent and more intense instances of harassment by the county government in collusion with the PEC and the Thomas family. 
In April of 2012, Martha was issued a citation from the county alleging three different zoning violations. We were found in violation of zoning, which carries criminal ramifications and up to $15,000 a day in, in violation fees for selling what we produce in, in this farm um, that we own. If that wasn't bad enough, they were also citing her for events. And the events they were talking about was a, a birthday party for eight 10 year old girls. Why would we need to have a site plan, special exception permit, administrative permit for a private gathering on private property? Um, that's written nowhere in the, in the ordinances. There's written nowhere in the county guidelines, yet the county viewed it as an event. And um, thereby we would need all of these additional permits and um, full-blown hearing site plans that would cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Martha had enough, and for the first time, she pushed back. Her friends and neighbors organized a pitchfork protest to rally in support of her Zoning Board of Appeals hearing. It's becoming very difficult for small to mid-sized farmers to compete and to survive and thrive in this current environment. There's another 154 farms that do exactly what Martha does. They sell produce off their farms to the individual. But the only person that's been cited for this is Martha. Martha lost her appeal, and the fines forced her to temporarily shutter her farm during the peak of the 2012 harvest. You know, we purchased our farm in 2006, spent years building the infrastructure, and then when they came after me, um, every day of my life has been in fear of what they're gonna do to me next. I've been farming in fear, and there were definitely times where you know, I, I, I thought there was no way I could continue doing this. It was, it was sleepless nights. It was, you know, devastating. It was dealing with constant criticism. Every day was a struggle. And there were times when I would really question my ability to continue on this, on this journey. And then I would pray about it. I would talk to my family. And, you know, my mother was always there saying, you can't give up. You know, keep fighting because it's not just for you make things better for other people so that, you know, the economic viability on the family farm isn't lost forever. Soon after the Zoning Board of Appeals hearing, Martha's story started to gain traction with the national press. The attention brought in more supporters. As new friends in the area and around the country shared their stories, Martha realized that her experiences weren't unique. Too often the government will step in and crack down on the rights of farmers, whether they're big or small, at the expense of our food production. I mean, this is, these are the people who make our food, who grow our food, who provide us with food. Martha Manetta's case is really an example of what's going on all across the country. And most of the issues we're seeing today involve the key amendment in our Bill of Rights the Fourth Amendment, which says we're to be secure, and that's the key word, in our houses, persons, papers, and effects. In our culture now, we have completely lost the ethic of property. We, 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 don't, we don't have it anymore. It is now perfectly appropriate for me to tell you what you can and cannot do with your own property. The basest unit of industry that America was founded on was farming. And now all of these rural localities are wanting to do away with farming or to regulate farming. We've had cases where somebody has a single chicken in their backyard to just get eggs or let their kids play with a pet chicken. It's illegal in a lot of places to have that. Newton, Massachusetts, there was a guy who was growing tomatoes in his front yard and uh, 
the government ripped them out. I think the same thing has happened in places like Michigan and Florida and Tennessee. I can't think of anything more ridiculous than telling people they can't grow their own food. The American dream on, on small family farms for the family farmer has become almost impossible to achieve. There are federal regulations, state regulations, uh, county regulations that, that are endless, miles and miles and miles of, of red tape and completely unrealistic in a rural agricultural community. And what's happening is that, you know, younger people that want to get into agriculture, they want a homestead, they want a farmstead, they want to bring back so much of our beautiful heritage, our rural agricultural heritage, they're finding that, that they're stopped before they can even get started. You know, this, this store is an is a extension of my farm. I have Mount Airy Farm. If the government wins against Martha, that means I can't sell. And this county has a lot of uh, little farms that people go to do the same thing. They go go to the farm and they buy their raw milk and they buy their, well, they don't buy the raw milk. They go and pay the fellow for their cow. <laughs> yeah, you better don't put that on there. <laughs> they buy their, they pay their share and their cow and pick up their raw milk for their pets. There you go. The officials are saying that uh, Martha can't do that, then so why is anybody else any different? As the industrial sector became neighbor unfriendly, then people looked to the government for relief, for remediation of things they didn't like to see, didn't like to hear, didn't like to smell. And so zoning grew out of a, a mindset of ordering the unsightly stuff over here. And as soon as we order the unsightly stuff over here, then of course, you know, that pendulum never sits in the middle. Then we began trying to order everything to the point where now, you know, the, the 1,500 square foot residential houses can be here, but we don't want them to intermingle with the 1,200 square foot houses. And what you have then is increasingly segregated schismatic tension in the culture as opposed to, to uh, integration. People come out because they want the fresh air and the sunshine and the wide open spaces, but they don't want what goes with it. And they don't understand. They think food comes from the grocery store. Politics is all a matter of numbers. Those supervisors, in representing their constituency, they've got a lot more folks screaming about the farms right. against them than the farm saying, hey, you're going to run us out of business. As long as you're not inviting other people to come, it's fine. But once you start inviting people to come to your farm, then you have a, quote, event. And that's really where the rub is. They don't want people coming. You know, it would be different if this were an inner city area with townhouses or homes close together. But we're literally surrounded by thousands of acres of farmland here. And it speaks to a larger issue, and that is of, you know, we wonder why we're losing our small family farmers, and if it's not from over-regulation, it's from, you know, communities being forced and pushed out because of these kinds of situations, and it's really heartbreaking because, you know, this is really the fiber of our nation. It was, it was built on small family farmers. After shuttering Liberty Farm, Martha knew that the only way to save her dream was to take her case to Virginia's General Assembly and advocate for a bill that would protect the rights of farmers across the state. Well, last year there was a bill that came before the assembly. Uh, Delegate Ligenfelter carried it, and it quickly became called the Bonetta Bill. I've talked to several legislators. They have never received so many phone calls about one bill than the Bonetta Bill. It, it, and it crossed political lines, too. We had Democrats and Republicans calling in. It, it made no difference. I believe that this is a nonpartisan issue. I think that property rights and the ability to make ends meet and the ability to be entrepreneurial and to work hard is really at the, at the cornerstone of being an American. House Bill 1430, otherwise known as the Bonetta Bill, was an amendment to Virginia's Right to Farm Act, which clarified that the law included the right to commerce on private property. If passed, it would mean that local governments no longer had the power to prevent farmers like Martha from selling their products or from inviting customers to visit their farms without a special permit. The Bonetta Bill faced immediate backlash in the legislature, and the personal attacks against Martha escalated. It began to get pushed back before it had even been filed um, as legislation. It was just drafted. 
I saw that the bill that she had originally was going to give so much power to the farm, quote unquote, over local government, that I saw the local government's reaction to be, we'll just do away with farm zoning and the process we'll do away with land use taxation. You know, and, and if you push anything too far, there's usually a push back from the opposing side. We found out that one of my elected officials, Peter Schwartz, had openly disclosed the private content of my IRS filings that I was the subject of an IRS audit to the community. And I was shocked because I hadn't received an IRS audit. And at first, my reaction was how odd that was. And I thought, wow, they will really say anything. Lo and behold, we received an IRS audit shortly after it had already been disclosed to the public from one of my elected officials. Regardless of the, that it was irrelevant to the, the zoning issues, he, he was using the IRS audit in the context of trying to persuade me that Martha is a bad person. It was, uh, like I said, shocking uh, to me. Uh, and, and Peter's a lawyer. First of all, how is it even possible that an elected official is privy to the tax returns that I file and then to disclose it publicly to others is shocking and terrifying. It's something that I struggle with every day. Um, the IRS audit itself has been like nothing I've ever experienced before. What's very unusual is that in my audit, Questions that, are, that were asked were nowhere reflected in my IRS documents. They were directly pertaining to the complaints in the county. While Martha dealt with the audit, Fauquier County sent a paid lobbyist, Eldon James, to fight against the Bonetta Bill at the State House. The county's efforts worked. The Bonetta Bill failed in 2013. They came up with a legislative trick. You could pass the bill with the reenactment clause, which meant it would take a year for it to be worked on and come back again. And so all the people in the House got to say that they passed the bill. Then it got to the Senate, and in the Senate committee hearing, only four people voted for the bill. So um, it died there. You know, this reaction was so visceral for people that were farmers as well as consumers. All of that energy, and then to have the bill defeated, was uh, was devastating. It was that glimmer of hope that we all held on to and thought, you know, perhaps if this bill passes, we won't farm in fear anymore and we will be free to prosper and be productive and the community would have access to more locally produced goods. It was a disappointing setback for Martha and her supporters, but there was still a chance to change the law. Martha's activism brought her an invitation to join the Virginia Department of Agriculture's On Farm Activities Working Group. Ms. Bonetta was one of the, the stakeholders on the group, folks from other independent farm organizations. Farm Bureau was there. Local governments had a seat at the table. And as a result of that work group, there were bills introduced this year. That's when I met Martha. And that's when I offered to privately meet with the Farm Bureau who had crafted a bill and pretty soon, within about four to six weeks, we had a bill that everybody could agree with and that just about guaranteed passage. This time, delegates like Bobby Iraq, who had rejected the first draft, supported the new Bonetta bill. And when the legislature voted on it again in March of 2014, it passed. It was one of the greatest days of my life. For myself and my family, but also for the community that had spent two years uh, taking time away from their families and their homes and their jobs. The people that made this possible, I don't know that how I could ever thank them. I think I could probably try every day and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible to thank everybody that, that made it possible to um, to move the ball forward just a little bit, my immediate reaction was just complete um, thankfulness. Very sincere, heartfelt thankfulness. It, it, it was a victory for, you know, the, the 
the small family farmer, and that hadn't really happened before. Hopefully it's the beginning of really untold opportunities across the state for producers that have either been engaging in these practices anyway, or were told they couldn't do them. You know, my doors are open and people are coming with their families. To have a little plot of land and to take in rescued animals and grow organic vegetables and do what you want to do on your property, not to bother anybody, but to be left alone, to provide a little bit of enjoyment for the community. I mean, that's what America is all about. And, and we've got people that want to not only stifle, but want to punish Martha for pursuing this little dream of hers. I think justice is, should be blind in this country. It's either good policy or it's politics. And I think it's good policy to open up the farms and create more opportunity for people in the rural areas where employment is so low. And it's something that we want to promote. It's good. I think it's very important that we allow small farmers to flourish rather than be under the heel of local government that doesn't want them to do what they want to do. My family didn't realize, we had no idea what was going on behind closed doors. We did not know that there was this force with the intention of forcing us off the farm. We had no idea. We thrive by lifting others up, not by pushing them down. You know, I know what it's like to be shut down. So I think that those fears will always be there um, because I've experienced them. But, but at the same time, um, I know that we can make a difference. No matter how many times the government tries to shut you down, to just have the faith and the courage and the hope to keep going. And uh, if enough people do that, then you know, we won't have to worry about losing our businesses or we won't have to worry about losing everything we've you know, hoped for and we'll be able to um, make sure that the American dream is alive and well. I don't want to be the one left standing It's as simple as that I've been standing on my own two feet now For a long, long time